104 KZZP, Journey, and Don't Stop Believing from Escape, 452, and Steve Goddard. When the time came for me to go to Japan, uh, I, I finished that third year of college, which was at NAU, and uh, prepared myself and made my way over to Japan in August of 1977. It was one of the few places where uh, the potter not only had room and uh, space for a, a foreign student, but could actually afford to pay a little bit so that we could live. And uh, I might have been the fifth or sixth one to come along. When I got to Mashiko, I found that there was a main workshop with six wheels in it, six potter's wheels. There was a guest workshop for traveling students to, who were just come, you know, uh, traveling through for a week or a month at a time. I had to learn to speak Japanese. Uh, the people I worked with didn't speak any English whatsoever. Mr. Shimoka spoke a little, but he didn't speak any when I was there just because I needed to learn Japanese, and I did. And this pottery of his in Mashiko was not a school. It was a working pottery where they made pots to sell, including everyday pots that got sold in the local marketplaces. Uh, and, and then the specialized pieces of Mr. Shimoka's that would go to the art galleries in Japan and would fetch a higher dollar. And so, um, and then there was Mr. Shimoka's uh, workshop that had two wheels in it where he was able to focus and do his, his own personal work. I spent two years at Mr. Shimoka's in Mashiko and, and then uh, was fortunate enough to go to Kyoto, the, the ancient Japanese capital, for a three month period to work with one of Mr. Shimoka's um, colleagues, Tsuneji Ueda, who, uh, who had space for me to work there for just a short period. And uh, Ueda works with porcelain and uh, at that time, and, um, and then in December of 1979, I made my way back to the States after uh, 27 months, and uh, then it was time to graduate with an Associate of Arts degree and decide what to do next, and uh, Bob Lundin, being my uh, guidance counselor, uh, said, where are you going next? You can keep taking these studies until you figure out what it is you want to major in and what you want to do with your life. And I said, what do you mean what I want to do with my life? This is what I want to do. And he said, well, you know, I wouldn't recommend to any of my students to try to do this as a living. Uh, and uh, I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> he, said, he said, well, you know, there are no jobs for potters or for ceramic artists, and uh, there, you know, you probably looked around and seen across the country there are a few people doing it. Uh, but there are very few, and it's a pretty tough way to make a living. You might want to think long and hard about that. So I, I like the, the idea of coming to Prescott and, and putting my own studio together, and I did. I built my own uh, kill out on White Spar Road in Prescott. I, my studio's name is Limberlost Pottery, and that came from the location of my first studio, which was the corner of Limberlost Lane and White Spar Road. I like the sounds of the name. and. Uh, I took it on as the name of my studio, so that's where I made my start, and I uh, joined the Crazy Quilt Crafts Cooperative down on Whiskey Row that uh, was a, a group of local artists and craftspeople that had a small shop space and uh, shared expenses and time manning the store in order to sell their craft works, and um, I, they invited me in, and I became a member of the Crazy Quilt, and uh, in the first year or so after Japan, what I wanted to make were the things I learned how to do in Japan, which was uh, little soy sauce containers and uh, sake cups and sake bottles, and nobody seemed to want to buy those. Um, so I looked around and saw what, what the other potters, for example, were making, and it, it kind of made logical sense to me. was able to sell some of my work and eke out a living 
figured out how some of the other artists uh, sold their work, which was to a craft show. And uh, I was telling you that what is, what is it that I that I want to do with my work? Uh, what kind of a statement do I want to make? And I think that with pottery, especially in trying to sell it, to make a living from it and sell it, what is it that people respond to? And uh, I found that that the sort of a universal, uh, the, the most widely accepted thing that, that, that seems to attract people is beauty, rather than make an artistic statement or doing uh, something sculptural or um, what is it that seems to draw people in and that is uh, uh, beautiful glazes, uh, beautiful surfaces. Uh, what can I do to mimic the beauty that I see in the world and that, that other people are attracted to as well. And um, I pulled out a few stones here because to me, but these are, these are pieces of chrysophrase from Australia. And um, this is the beauty that the earth has, has uh, made over eons of time, right? And uh, why is it that people are attracted to this stuff? Why we think that it's beautiful, you know? I try to uh, produce things that will have a natural kind of feel to them like these stones. Uh, something that happens in the kill where the glazes will flow together and it almost looks like a piece of uh, geology, uh, although it, it's, it's very clearly man-made. Mm. But um, the materials used in the, the glazes especially and ceramics are similar materials that that produce this sort of thing in the earth um, and the potter's work is to gather those materials and um, mix them together and make glazes and put them through a firing process where they'll they become molten again like some of these stones were at one time when they were formed and uh, to do sort of a condensed version of our own uh, man-made geology in a way. It's like we're reproducing some of the, uh, the effects that happen in Mother Earth, uh, except it happens in a much shorter period of time. Mm. And they don't really look the same by any means, but we're able to produce the effects of things um, that are kind of similar uh, to the stones and natural beauty that we find in the earth so yeah i'm a potter and what am i doing working with stones and concrete these are pieces of concrete that i have cast into molds and um, they're all different pieces that are going to go into a concrete countertop installation and i do still make pottery of course it's my main thing but i'm really enjoying these and the more I've worked with them, the more I, I realize how connected the materials and the process is to uh, the ceramics in many ways. In many ways it's different, but it's taking earth materials like clay and the glazes, materials that go into ceramic glazes come out of the earth. They're mined minerals and, and earth materials and they're fired and with the concrete work it's earth materials as well um, a lot of the really fine stones in here are sand and pebbles out of the ground that is, makes up the aggregate that goes into a concrete mix this is a concrete mix of my formulation that has some iron oxide in it that gives it its brownish color otherwise it would be gray concrete as we're all used to seeing and there are also pieces of glass in here that I've put in. Um, it's called slag glass, this stuff. Um, I love working with this stuff. It's some, the glass, of course, was fire formed by industry. And uh, so that fire was used to make that. There were some other pieces of glass here. And then a lot of the stones that come out of the earth uh, were, were fire formed as part of their process over the eons of and they're making. Here's a, here's a big piece of, uh, it's called Crocodile Jasper from Madagascar that is really beautiful and how can anybody resist 
this. So the thing that's really compelling to me about working with concrete and these sorts of stones is uh, I just go find something really beautiful like this. And I didn't make that, but I get to take credit for it by locking it up in concrete and uh, m making a, a, a setting as though it's a giant piece of jewelry. Really, I mean, countertops in the kitchen are like jewelry for the kitchen. There's, they're capturing all of these stones and pieces of glass and fossils and uh, they're put, being put into to place where they they can be enjoyed. Unlike uh, the processes that I use to make pottery and fire it, I can see what I'm working with with this stuff because I pick up a piece of stone and it's done. It's, uh, I, I, what you see is what you get with that. And there's, that's kind of a unique, uh, a novel new thing for me because over the years with my pottery and firings, I'd put pots into the kiln and I really didn't know just what they were gonna look like coming out um, because the process of, of forming the glazes on the surfaces, you know, a type of stone or glass in that case, is happening in the kiln. And I'm outside the kiln, and the pots are inside the kiln, and I'm controlling the fire and the oxygen, uh, or lack of oxygen and all of those things, but I don't know what it's gonna look like. But working with these materials, I know what they're gonna look like as I'm, as I'm working, and there's something really kind of fun about that. I can pick and choose, and uh, the more I cut or grind into the surface of a piece, it changes, you know, the different layers. Uh, it progressively turn into a little bit different design. These two stones over here are called Brazilian agate. And they come in like a big roundish rock. And when you slice it open and you get these slices out of it, that's what it looks like. But you wouldn't know it by before the rock was cut open or broken open. It looks like just a rough crude rock up on the ground, you know, although they mine these out of the ground. But um, they only reveal their beauty when they're once they're cut open. So customers are local, of course. I don't, these being heavy like they are, I'm not putting them in boxes and shipping them to the East Coast <laughs> like I have done for many years with my pottery. And um, so having local customers where I can deliver these and, and set them in people's homes is a, is a new experience for me too, and I kind of enjoy that. Uh, there's no uh, shipping involved. I can put them in my Jeep and uh, or in the trailer and carry them over there and set them in place. Nice. Oftentimes, a lot of the stones that I'm using are out of the collections of the people that I'm commissioned to make the pieces for. For example, um, the gal and her husband that I'm making these for, when I did their kitchen countertops, uh, I put a lot of stones in it that are exposed now that were from her father's rock collection. And she had them in shoe boxes, of course, for decades, however long she'd had them since she received them from her father. And, um, and now she gets to live around them because they're captured in this cement matrix and living in her kitchen. So she really enjoys that. It reminds her of her dad. And, uh, they're familiar stones because she had them all along. And then there's a, a lot of stones that I put in that I, I, I took from my collection and put in there for her too. So, um, but that's kind of neat to use uh, items in the, in the countertops that um, belong to the folks that I'm making them for. And um, that actually happens fairly, fairly often. Here we are at Van Gogh's Year Art, Art Gallery on Whiskey Row in Prescott, Arizona on a beautiful mor spring morning and uh, I've got some of my work behind me on the wall uh, surrounded by the artwork of many other artists and one of the things I like about being in a place like this is it's full of handmade work and I'm guessing like some of the other artists, artists I'm guessing are like me they they want to live a handmade life and that's what we're doing. We're making things by hand. I've been doing it since I was a kid in high school and uh, I'm still doing it 40 some years later. So, so 
So I've been in Van Gogh's ear since 2002, somewhere thereabouts, a little over 15 years now since they first opened up. And uh, very sweet people to work with. Um, they get to do all of the hard work of being in here every day and representing all of the artists while we get to be in our studios uh, doing our thing and uh, being a hermit if we feel like it. And uh, they do a good job, good folk. As well as Van Gogh's Year Art Gallery in Prescott. Um, my work is represented in, in various galleries throughout the United States, uh, including Anchorage, Alaska, for example. It's ended up in conference rooms at, at banks, I've heard. I've not been there, but uh, I, I'll get an order from a gallery once in a while and have to make and then pack pack up a bunch of pieces and ship them off and then I hear they, where they end up and get pictures and so forth but I don't get to go visit them if they're too far away. East coast of the United States, North Carolina, New York, Sedona, Arizona and Enchantment Resort, we'll put that in there. Uh, great place. Uh, so yeah, and I've, I've been in uh, exhibitions in Japan because I did my apprenticeship over there and I've stayed in contact with uh, good folks over in Japan. and. Uh, been back to visit a few times and make some pots and leave over there for exhibition and sale. So some of the pieces up on the wall are porcelain and some are stoneware and you kind of have to, to know what the difference is. But I'm working with both of these types of clay and we've talked about that before. And uh, uh, so the work starts off with clay and, and then it gets glazed and fired. And the glazed materials as we've talked about before, come out of the earth. There are minerals that have been ground up like feldspars and silicas, dolomites, uh, calcium, things like that, and they make glazes that go on the pots and uh, give it sort of a stone-like, a polished stone-like quality. And that's a lot of what I like about it. There, It's earth materials. I get to work with things that come out of the ground and uh, We've talked about it as well. I'm working with concrete and stone and fossils these days, making concrete countertops and uh, tables for the patio and things like that. And uh, uh, it also is working with things that came out of the ground. Everything that goes into concrete and uh, the, the, the countertops I, I do are come out of the earth and they're mined and uh, processed. and. The round element that I have going with the big platters is something that just seems to draw people in. It wasn't my idea to make something round like that, but it's very effective. And uh, like the, the, the square or rectangular framed pieces of art that we see in the gallery here, uh, it's more conventional with 2D art that gets framed in. The, the shields that I call them that I make are round and they are a little bit like a satellite dish when you think about it and they do have uh, the quality of sort of pulling you in a little bit a sort of a focal point and um, and I work that that's the experience I have with them and I've heard that that that, that that's the experience other ha people have as well so I like that about it Perfect. okay yeah. all right we're ready so as I'm going into the middle or perhaps later part of my life, I look forward to continuing, continuing to work with my hands, whether it be with clay and glazes or stones and concrete, uh, wood, which I've tried. I like working on old houses, including my own, and uh, wow. carrying on in the lineage yeah. of <laughs> my teacher. Have you been there before? I've never been there before. I okay. picked up clay um, while he was in a holding camp in after England. World War II, waiting to go back to Japan and had nothing to do but there was clay on the ground and he was able to pick it up and mold some little pots with his hand in order to pass the time be before he was allowed to go back to Mashiko in Japan and, and uh, build his studio and start his life of, of making pots and, uh, and I've always, I, I often reflect on that. I like doing that as well, just taking clay or things that I know came out of the earth and working with them and hope I have many more years to do this and um, just carry on with that lineage and with the internet and the modern uh, conveniences we have I see all across the country there are young people working with clay 
that are picking, taking the torch and going with it and uh, making some really fantastic pots w with it in their young lives. And it looks like they're going forward with it as well. So I'm pleased about that. Yeah, um, in Santa Arenas, which uh -huh. so has great I guess what I guys, would like for really people to see in my work is uh, something that has been handmade by a human being that would have something of a natural feeling to it, like something that might have been produced in nature, like uh, moss or lichen or a polished stone, things like that, that nature produced. Human beings are natural creatures made by nature as well, and we can do things that, that might appeal to uh, the beauty in nature, and that, that's something that I always appreciate if people can get out of it and they want to hopefully take some of my work and put into their homes and live around it and uh, uh, th that's that's very pleasing to me and gratifying that what I do with my hands can end up being enjoyed in someone's home. So, uh, there are geometric aspects to some of the pieces like this here um, but geometry is really found abundantly in nature and uh, in, a, in the petals of a flower, for example, or uh, the striations in a crystal. Um, some of these, you could say, look like the seed head on a sunflower, um, a pool of water that's frozen with cracked ice on the top.